Jesus. Welcome tonight to Christian Life World on this Thursday night. We are going into um, our second part of a passion for his presence. A passion for his presence. If you were not able to be um, with us last Thursday, you can uh, watch that Passion for His Presence Part 1 again, and I would encourage you to do so. Amen. I'm going to the book of Acts, the 15th chapter, and beginning at the 14th verse, Acts 15, and beginning at verse number 14. God is going to do something awesome in our lives today as His Word speaks to us. Amen. Praise God. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. A passion for his presence. Lord Jesus, minister, Lord, your seed to, Lord God, the hearer. Lord, I pray that your word would find good ground in the heart of every life, in the spirit of every man, every woman, every boy and girl. I bind, Lord, any opposing force and bless you for the miracle of your provision as your word begins to work mightily in every soul and every heart. And we give you praise for victory in each life in the matchless and glorious name of Jesus. And everyone shout amen and give God some high praise. Hallelujah. God, we give you praise and honor in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Passion for his presence. Last week, we answered the question of why God would want to rebuild the tabernacle of David instead of Moses' tabernacle in the wilderness or Solomon's temple with all of its beauty. David's makeshift tent barely qualifies to some as a tabernacle. But we find and have found that David's tabernacle was God's favorite house. The reason being God spent more time there than in any other tabernacle. And the answer why is because God inhabits the praises of his people. So David... He had a tabernacle of praise, a tabernacle where there was giving of glory and honor to God. It was David, the king of Israel, whose first desire after becoming king was to bring the presence of the Lord back into the house of God. And so the Bible says in 2 Samuel 6 and verse number 15, David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. In the Old Testament, David and God's people understood that the ark of the covenant, the ark of the testimony, the ark of God was God's presence among his people. And without it, it there was no presence in the house of God that upon that ark was the mercy seat where the glory of God would speak to, to God's people, to the high priest, to his people, and that there would be that Shekinah that would hover under the cherubim's wings above the mercy seat. David's desire was to get that presence of God back into Jerusalem. And so immediately... When they set up the ark of God in the house of God, David's tabernacle, David demanded at the beginning, at the, on, uh, at the beginning of this time where God's presence began to again be in the house of God, he demanded that the Levites, those that took care of God's things, those that took care of the house of God, that they would begin offering 24-hour-a-day worship 
unto the Lord. There was not a day that went by that there was not worship being offered unto God 24 hours a day in David's tabernacle. That was the difference that we find between David's tabernacle and Solomon's temple or Moses' tabernacle in the wilderness. When you would look at the worshipers, they became the veil around the ark because there was no veil around the ark keeping the presence of God from the people of God in David's tabernacle. The worshipers became the veil around the ark. And to worship him, they would face toward the ark of God, magnifying and glorifying the Lord, and they would turn their back to man. Therefore, they were saying, we're going to trust the Lord and not man. We're going to be and desire to be in the presence of the Lord and not just in the presence of man because God inhabits our praise. Amen. I am praying tonight that someone would get a hold of these, these powerful truths and desire to have a passion for the presence of God. Psalm 22, verse 3, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest, lives in, abides in the praises of Israel. The Japanese translation says a praise of Israel builds a big chair for God to sit on. You see, we prop open the heavens with our uplifted hands and our uplifted praise, propping open heaven so that the glory of heaven might shine upon his people. We, hallelujah, must have a passion for the presence of God. Hallelujah. Now, we understand one thing about David's tabernacle. David's tabernacle kept heaven open for nearly 36 years. 36 years they worshiped 24-7. 36 years they kept the heaven open, propped open with their praise. But then it changed after David's tabernacle. And so that is why God wants to rebuild the tabernacle of David that fell when men made church dead, dry, and boring. In essence, non-essential. We are living in a time where there they are telling you what's essential and non-essential. The church needs to reinstate itself as an essential business in this hour. Essential means of the utmost importance, indispensable and necessary. I'm here to tell you that the church of God is necessary. We are essential, especially in this hour where so much fear and darkness permeates our world. The church needs to arise and reinstate, reinstate itself as the most essential business on planet earth in the matchless name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The psalmist said, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Why would you rather be a doorkeeper? Why would you rather be in the house of God, in the courts of God? A doorkeeper, hallelujah, at the right door has some incredible influence, doesn't he or she? Remember, they ministered nonstop to the Lord 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for nearly 36 years. So a doorkeeper in God's house would have seen the Shekinah of God, the power of God whenever they stood in that place where there was nonstop praise offered unto the Lord. David's tabernacle, the glory was seen by everyone. That is what Christian life world must become. A church that regardless of what the people of God are going through, regardless of what we, how we may be feeling, that we will cease 
not to worship the Lord. That is what you must do. Wherever you're listening from, you must, regardless of what's going on around about you, regardless of how dark the nightly news becomes, you must cease not to praise and worship the God of creation. Hallelujah, the name of Jesus. Why? Because the Lord is my light and my salvation whom shall I fear the Lord is the strength of my life of whom shall I be afraid can I get a witness in the house when the wicked even mine enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up of my flesh they stumbled and fell why is it that my enemies stumbled and fell when they try to take me down because I'm worshiping the Lord uh, and worship brings the presence of God and the enemies fall in the presence of the Lord Amen. though an host should encamp against me my heart shall not fear this is Psalm 27 a Psalm of David the, the one that God wanted his tabernacle and said I will rebuild his tabernacle again he said though an host should encamp against me my heart shall not fear the war shall rise against me in this will I be confident one thing have I desired of the Lord and that will I seek after sounds like a doorkeeper mentality doesn't it it sounds like a worship mentality doesn't one thing have I desired of the Lord and and that will I seek after that I may dwell, uh, live in, uh, abide in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord uh, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, that's what we might be in right now. But it's all right, church, because in the time of trouble, shall he hide me in his pavilion? God's going to hide me in his tabernacle, the secret of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock and now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me therefore will I make my way to the house of God and offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy I will sing yea I will sing unto the Lord hear O Lord when I cry with my voice David said have mercy also upon me and answer me when thou saidest seek Keep my face, thy fallible see on thy face, hallelujah. My heart said, thy face will I seek. It's time for the church to arise and to have a passion for his presence. Hallelujah. Oh, I bless you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God, I give you praise. Why don't you praise him wherever you're at right now? For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. The psalmist said, I will praise the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually, continually, that's David's tabernacle, be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast of the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together God's going to bring us through whatever he takes us to we just need to be worshipers hallelujah hallelujah God's not looking for stained glass. Uh, he's not looking for the most beautiful and the biggest edifice. He's looking for a house of uh, praise, uh, a house that will dare uh, to praise the name of the Lord our God. A people not ashamed to shout uh, and to dance uh, and to talk in tongues uh, and to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover to baptize in Jesus' name and to believe God. Hallelujah, for he is greater than every need that we face. God loved that humble tent. Hallelujah, became God's favorite. Hallelujah, home or house because God loves praise and inhabits praise. 
the Bible tells us in praise is God known or in Judah, Judah means praise and Judah is God known. In praise, God is known. If you want to know God, start magnifying him. It doesn't make sense to man, but it doesn't have to make sense. It's the truth. Hallelujah. For God's ways are above our ways. Hallelujah. We cannot comprehend, hallelujah, his ways. I'm just going to obey his ways. Hallelujah. Because all my life of living for God, God has never let me down once. I could be, I could say, like the psalmist, I'm old, but I was young. Yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor is seed out begging bread. God is a good God and he's worthy of our praise. Hallelujah. Somehow, David learned something during his attempts to bring the ark back to Jerusalem that helped him step beyond the limitations of the deadly separation of the veil into the whole new realm of intimacy with God. I want you to listen to me now because I'm going to talk about how that David understood that you can't change God's ways or God's way and God's word and God's precepts and God's, God's rule of law and still have his presence. You can't do it your way. And so David, in 2 Samuel 6, verse 1, this is the first attempt. We didn't read about the first attempt yet. We read about the second attempt for David to bring the presence of God, the ark of God, into Jerusalem. But the first attempt, notice this. David gathered together, verse 1, all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. Man, anything like that, you would think God would just go ahead and go with it, wouldn't you? David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. Got your new cart, God. We're going to put it on there. You're going you're to have a good ride, Lord. And brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah and Uzzah and Ahio and the, son, the sons of Abinadab drave the new cart. So they're driving the cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord. They're praising God uh, of, on all manners of instruments. It sounded awesome, made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and timbrels and cornets and on sim on cymbals and man it was just a celebration they were having church and when they came to Nacon's threshing floor Yuza put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen shook it and the anger of the Lord was kindled up against Yuza and God smote him there for his heir and there he died before the ark wait a minute why in the world would they have church and God would take one of them away? And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah and he called the name of the place Perazu Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but carried it aside in that into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Christians around the world are saying we want revival. But unfortunately, we haven't learned from David's mistakes. We try to cram the holy things of God on a new cart of man's making. Thinking that God will be pleased. Hey, weren't they having church? Weren't they singing? Didn't they have the choir there? Didn't they have... The, everything was seemingly so awesome, new stuff, a new way. But God won't let oxen pull the cart 
carrying his glory. We expect someone or someone else to sweat out the hard part of revival. All we want to do is sing and dance in the procession. These man-centered revivals go smoothly until we hit a God bump <laughs> at the threshing floor. There's a lot to that. God bumps happen at the threshing floor. And God says you can't handle me casually. You are going to have to sweat it out. Do it yourself. There is no substitute for prayer, for fasting, preaching the word of God, having old-fashioned church. You can have your cart or you can have the ark. you got to make the choice, but you can't have both. And one man died when he tried to stabilize what God shaken we can only create a user friendly environment as long as it doesn't interfere with our God friendly environment the ark was only to be transported on the shoulders of sanctified Levites <laughs> that's hard work it's not name it and claim it and blab it and grab it it's hard work. So in 2 Samuel 6, we read first about the second attempt. Now notice David's heart. He only waited three months. He didn't wait three years. He didn't wait 10 years. David said, I got to figure out what I did wrong so I can make it right. We might make a mistake, but we always have a God that is faithful and merciful and so David said oh God I made a mistake but that doesn't mean I'm not desiring your presence I still have a passion for your presence but David said I learned a good lesson I can't do it my way I've got to come to you through truth Jesus said I am the door there's only one there's no other way to hallelujah heaven hallelujah anybody that tries to get in any other way is a thief and a robber Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me but we have a lot today uh, that are putting God uh, on a new card, saying it doesn't take all that. I'm here to tell you it takes repentance from dead works, uh, water baptism in the saving name of Jesus for the remission or erasing of those sins and the infilling of the Spirit of God. For Jesus said, if you have not my Spirit, you are none of his, none of mine, not part of me. And so we picked back up where we read where it went well. God was blessing Obed-Edom's home. David took the priest down there. They got everything right this time. They still shouted and danced and sung, but they did it the right way. They didn't do it man's way. They did it God's way because it was never God's intent to have that holy presence on an ox. Now, what I like about this, because this is what's amazing to me, we know that every six paces they stopped and they sacrificed and they praised God, right? But what did they offer? The Bible said they offered oxen. <laughs> they offered the oxen. Why? Because it was never God's intent to let the ox pull God it was God's intent to let the blood of the ox cleanse. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Hallelujah. So the strength, because an ox was strong. The ox is a symbol of strength, but it is the weakness of man that will carry the ark of God's presence. So they carried the ark that day nearly 15 miles. My goodness, how did they cover 15 miles stopping every six paces? I can tell you this, if you were carrying, none of us probably could walk 15 miles. But they did. And those that when they entered the gate of Jerusalem, they weren't looking their Sunday best, honey. 
They had just shouted for 15 miles. Those priests carrying the ark of God were sweating and smelling and, and they looked like they had just went through a war. But the presence of God was coming back into Jerusalem. So either you're going to bring it on a new cart. God says, I'm not going to be any part of it. You can have your church. You can do your own thing. But there will be no signs and wonders and miracles. Or you can do it the way of truth. And you can see, hallelujah, the blinded eyes open. The deaf ears unstopped. The marriage is put back together. And a sin stricken soul come to an altar and find rest for his soul and the forgiveness of sins. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. We close today, tonight, excuse me, with a song of degrees. Song of degrees means a song of elevation, a journey to a higher place. It's Psalm 134. Behold, bless ye the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, which by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord, the Lord that made heaven and earth bless thee out of Zion. The psalmist said there is no greater calling to man than to bless the Lord. So right where you are, why don't you stand? Raise your hands, weep, whatever you want to do to worship the Lord. But let us right now close this night service out with worship to God. Hallelujah. Let the passion for his presence come upon you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. Hallelujah. Let there be a passion on Monday morning, on Thursday. Tuesday morning, on Wednesday morning, on Thursday morning, on Friday morning, on Saturday morning, whenever, whatever day, hallelujah, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether I'm feeling good or not feeling so well. It doesn't matter whether I've got money in my pocket or I don't have any. I'm going to praise the Lord at all times. I'm going to have a passion for his presence in the name of Jesus. Just worship him right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just worship him and magnify him right now. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. Hallelujah. When David and all the house of Israel got it right, God's power and presence and the miracles and the signs and wonders for 36 years dwelled in Jerusalem and amongst God's people. That's what God wants for us right now. So in your prayer this weekend, you need to be praying, God, I, I have a passion for your presence. Let me do the work of God. Let me seek the will of God. Let me continue to worship regardless of how I feel, regardless of what it looks like around about me. And Lord God, I know there's victory. But and then I'll become an overcomer when I, hallelujah, will dare to praise you at all times. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah, we give you praise and glory and honor. Thank you for being with us tonight. May the Lord bless you in Jesus' name.